it was just crazy. And so here I go and I'm like, okay, for two weeks, I'm, I'm going to take all my work with me. That was a really dumb move. But I wanted to have the full experience of being a single working mother to a toddler. I set out like, I'm going to prove to myself that I can do this. And I'm going to finish up this intro. And I'm going to be totally gung ho. And then I'm going to go out and make myself a baby and get on with my life. That was my plan. And I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to have this great end to my story, whether it's I, at that point, I don't even think I was thinking of it being a book yet. But I'm going to have this beautiful end to this story. If this is funny, you know, it's gonna be really funny. And it was so loving. I had this great internship. And I learned everything I needed to know and got all the motivation I needed. And then I came home and have this miracle baby and my life is perfect. Hmm. Disinformation is spreading. There will be a we surprise so outbreak. Is the issue of pandemic no social distancing at all? They, they said that they would express their concerns um, about so the mask quickly. supply. Where's the mask? Where's the gloves? A second wave is we all need some good news. A message for all the healthcare workers out there. Thank you. From Santa Rosa, California, this is 19 Stories. I'm Cheryl Holling. I am so excited to be back with you after taking a bit of a summer break, especially with the guest that's joining me today. Kathleen Guthrie Woods is a Bay Area award-winning author, freelance copywriter, and editor. For over 22 years, she's been the chief cook and bottle washer of her own company, Kathleen Inc., from which she provides freelance writing and copy editing for Disney Buena Vista Miramax, the Tavis Smiley Group, and Noise 13, a San Francisco branding and design agency. She's also penned for San Francisco Attorney Magazine and brands within the lifestyle food and beverage and wine and spirit spaces. For eight years, Kathleen wrote a weekly column for LifeWithoutBaby.com, a website dedicated to giving a voice to women who are child-free by chance, choice, or circumstance. In 2013, she co-authored the book Life Without Baby, Holiday Companion a compilation of humorous, healing, and thought-provoking posts designed to help other childless women get through the holidays while getting closer to making peace with being child-free. In 2018, Kathleen launched her own blog, 52 Nudges, in which she takes what she refers to as weekly risks to push her out of her sometimes too comfortable nest. But perhaps her most poignant work to date is her second book, the Mother of All Dilemmas, Dreams of Motherhood, and the Internship That Changed Everything. A memoir about finding her worth in a world as a childless woman by choice, which was named as one of Aspire Magazine's top 10 inspiring books, as well as a finalist in the peer-led Wishing Shelf Book Awards. There's much to talk about with this dynamic and interesting woman, author, wife, friend, and world's greatest aunt. I'd like to welcome Kathleen Guthrie Woods to 19 Stories. I have to say, it's rather interesting to hear about myself like that. I've been busy. <laughs> yes, you have. And that's one of the reasons I love doing a little bit lengthier introductions than a lot of podcasts do, because that is the number one response I get yes. when people hear their oh life reiterated back to them. They tend to say, I've done these yeah. things. Wow. I'm kind of patting myself on the back right now. So. Kathleen, thank you very much for joining me. And I want to begin by wishing you a happy Bring Your Manners to Work Day, which you may or may not know falls every year on the first Friday in September. It's the day we're recording this episode. That's so perfect. So I'll do my best to mind my manners. I love it. You're very welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here, be talking about all these things. I'm happy to be speaking with you once again and a fellow Bay Area resident at that and reconnecting with you after all these years. And if I can take a moment and speak to any listener who may be considering launching a podcast as to the power of podcasting <laughs> and how it can bridge time and space and reunite relationships. As yeah. you called me after listening to an episode I did with mm -hmm. a mutual friend of ours, mm -hmm. which not only rekindled our friendship but also reunited a group of old friends via Zoom that had not gathered for over 20 plus years. And I am so grateful you did that because here we are yeah. getting to chat even more and talk about your powerful book. Yeah. And, and I feel like, especially with that reunion of friends, we picked up just where we left off. 
Yes. I love when that happens. It's just, it's, it's such a wonderful feeling. And to reconnect as slightly older adults with a lot more life experience and those relationships just continued. And it's, yeah, you never know. You never know who you're going to reach the ripple effects when you put your work out into the world. And that's one of the great gifts of it. Which I know you're finding out in regards to your work. Mm -hmm. And I think in sharing someone's story, it's important to touch upon the key motivators as to why someone chooses a particular life or creative path. And you originally graduated from UCLA with a degree in English Mm -hmm. and then took a bit of a circuitous route with work in various fields before coming back to your initial interest and passion. Mm -hmm. And I would love it if you could talk a bit about the work you were doing that led to the health crisis you mentioned in your book. (laughs) And how that led you to owning your own company and becoming the very prolific writer that you are today. Yeah, You know, let me start by saying that I, I had always done writing and editing in some form, although I never, I never, I never dreamt of writing the great American novel. That wasn't what I wanted to do. I was more of a, a business writer and editor and I did very well and graduated from college and was kind of left with the, well, what do I do now? And I took jobs that were offered, you know, and got to use some of that skill. Or honestly, you know, I was the friend that helped other friends proofread their resumes kind of thing, helped out here and there, and dipped my toe into a little bit here, a little bit there. And leading up to all this point, I was working in a leadership position, a director position, and I was working 14 hour days, sometimes seven days a week, because the job was big and it was crazy. And it just, there was always a need, right? There was always a need. And I just kept trying to fill And It, it, it was the kind of job you're never going to catch up on. And I ended up getting <laughs> very sick. And as I was trying to figure out, you know, the causes of that illness, which the ultimate cause was sleep deprivation, because I just mm. was not taking care of myself. And one of the doctors said to me, you either change everything in your life, or this is going to kill you. And I took that very seriously. And I quit that job, which was actually really hard to do, and just had this wide open space as I was trying to recover physically. And I thought, all right, what can I do from home while I'm recovering? And I started reaching out and freelancing and calling friends. Hey, do you need help with any editing projects? I had friends who were graphic designers. Do you need any copy? And then I literally, and this is one of my big, great open secrets, I pulled out the pages of publishers from the yellow pages back when we had yellow pages, those big <laughs> books, those big paper doorstops. Yes, yes. And I called every publisher and I asked them if they hired freelancers. And I still have clients from those cold calls. Which is such a progressive act to do because mm-hmm. now so many people are doing that now, direct client contact, which yeah. before it was, oh, you have to go through certain channels. And for you to do that back then, and if I may ask for a moment, you know, of course, without naming what that company was or what you were doing, mm-hmm. I believe that was about the time I met you. Yeah, it was. Okay. It was. I, right. I, we probably, I can't, I can't remember exactly the time. Yeah, but it would have been all about that time. And it, it just, you know, everything in my Everything in my life changed, how I exercised, what I ate, when I ate. I was notorious for having a yogurt at five o'clock in the morning and pasta at 10 o'clock at night and not and little in between. So it was, it was a very unhealthy pattern, but that was the environment that I lived and worked in. This was in LA. We've talked about the pressures in LA and I was just doing my best to keep up and didn't. And so following up is that these cold calls led to eventually some work. And every time I'd finish a job, I'd say, do you know anyone else who could use my services? And that I built, uh, the next thing I knew, I had a full-time business and that's what I did. That is amazing. First of all, you took the cue Mm -hmm. because how many times do people get an opportunity to to coin the phrase that a lot of people are using now, pivot. Yeah. And you took that. In fact, if I recall correctly, there were a couple of things I saw you go through and you had some seizures mm-hmm. and some a story you told me about going to a restaurant where you thought the food was, you asked, <laughs> I think it was macaroni and cheese. You had an anaphylactic shock yep. uh, incident. <laughs> and But again, you got the cue that it's time to make a change in your life and you did it. And I have to say, because you and I met and we got to know each other for that slice of time, but there was so much I was still learning about you. One of the things I just discovered when doing some homework on you prior to meeting today, you and I both worked for Great Expectations. When I saw that on your resume, I went, what? Did we not ever put that together? No. Oh, that's No, in fact, you left 
I think a year or two before I started with them. Where, where, okay, so we got to dig into this a little bit because this is hysterical. So for people who don't know, <laughs> yes. Great Expectations was the premier video dating service back in the day, hugely oh, successful <laughs> national company. And that was my first job out of college, my very first job. And I worked as an assistant to the director of communications, who is still a friend. Can you say who that was? I don't think I can. No, I don't think I want to name names. I don't want to get too much in what the corporate environment was like. But yeah, so I worked in the corporate offices and I, I actually did get to use some of my writing and editing skills, which was phenomenal and, and helped them. And yeah, I was there for, for several years. I can't believe we just missed each other. So were you, where were you? In Encino. I was in the Encino corporate office. That is Shut scary. the front door. Small yes. flipping world. I know. And we, we, never and we have that. ever discovered this if we hadn't had this conversation today. No. When I saw that, I went, oh, come on. What are the chances? Yeah. One of my jobs was to report the success stories, to write the success stories. Now, were you ever a client as well? Yes, I was. So, uh, oh gosh, this is really getting into the weeds here. This is so going up. Do mention in, in my memoir that I, I had a college boyfriend and so much of the expectation of college was you went there to get married. That's really embarrassing to say that now, but that's sort of what I was groomed for. And I had this wonderful boyfriend in college who broke up with me right after I graduated and it, it, and he's a, he's a wonderful human being. So I'm not trashing him at all, but it just, I just leveled me like, well, what am I supposed to do if I didn't, I didn't get married. I didn't do the one thing I was expected to do is how it felt. And then I get a job at a dating service dating. And, okay, whatever. <laughs> and they kept saying, you know, you get an employee discount if you do it. And I was like, I'm so not ready. I was so not ready. And then I thought, I just have to do this. I did, I just well, I just need to get myself out there again and so I went through the whole process and did my interviews and whatever and did the videos and took the photos and you know writers don't have bad experiences because it's all material. But let me just say that I <laughs> met some very interesting people along the way and they made for some very funny stories but there was there was not a love connection ultimately <laughs> through that. Uh, well, I remember you telling me about some of your, and again, we are so t going <laughs> off topic know. and we'll, we'll get back. Okay, but, okay. Um, I remember you telling me about some of your dates and I didn't know if they were, well, I mean, of course I didn't know you worked for Great yeah. Expectations, but did you categorize oh, some I of did. your dates? Oh, they all had names. This is terrible. Yes. I remember Plate Scraper, that he, all he did is use coupons and he had is like two me? bites of food. Yeah, I think so. Oh my gosh. I, I remember one guy showing up. What were those? Remember those booklets where you'd get coupons and it was discounts yes, every place in town? Yes. And he whipped one of those out. I was like, okay, well, he's thrifty, but I wasn't impressed at the time. Yes. that And it was the same guy, I think. And then the other one with the heavy German accent who mentioned oh, your blue oh eyes. My God, and you that was epic. <laughs> I haven't thought about that in for ages. We'll yeah. tell the story because I ended okay. up, that story ended up being published somewhere. Really? Um, yeah, he was, he wasn't German. He was, I think he was Austrian. He had a very, he oh, sounded okay. like I'm Arnold sorry. Schwarzenegger. Okay. But it was even a heavier accent. And so he was very, um, let's just say aggressive. And I was like, you know, Hey, I'm just, I'm just getting to know people, whatever. And we had gone out to this restaurant or bar and he, we're talking about whatever. And I'm chatting with him and he interrupts me and he says, you have a beautiful ass. And I lost my mind. <laughs> And I, I, I just read it. I said, shame on you. How dare you? I know that was something I said. I said, you, you, this is so inappropriate. We barely know each other. You don't say, you don't, you don't treat American women like this. That was one of my lines. But I'm oh loud gosh. enough that the other people in the restaurant have stopped talking Boy, and what they're staring is at going me and losing on? their minds. And, and I, I just reading the riot act and thinking we're done. And then I finally said to him, what were you thinking? And he says, well, they're just a beautiful shade of blue. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm sorry, what? And yeah. and he and I said, "What's a beautiful shade of blue? Well, your eyes, my eyes, my eyes." eyes. He my said, eyes. eyes. I heard ass. And I was like, <laughs> "Okay, oh, well, thank you." <laughs> you know, I, I just, just there was no recovering from that one. <laughs> well, how can you? I I have always remembered that story that you've told me because it, it was so funny. So, and so many others, you know, I, I think you, when you worked at Nordstrom, the guy who came in from his acupuncture treatment was still needles in his head and part oh, of the Red God, Sea. Yes. I mean, all these things. Anyway, I've had, a, I've had a very colorful life. You've had a very colorful <laughs> life. And I've mentioned that in your intro, okay. in addition to you penning for some really impressive companies and brands. So I'm wondering, how then did the opportunity come about for you to write 
for lifewithoutbaby.com for Mm -hmm. eight years Mm -hmm. and then co-authored the companion book, Life Without Baby Holiday Edition. Yeah. I took a writing class. I'm going to go back a little bit, but I took a writing class at UCLA Extension. And I was just at a time in my career where I felt like I was starting to write all the same things. And I was doing great. I was working almost full time at Disney at that point and doing some really fun things. But I thought, you know what? I felt the itch to challenge myself. And so I signed up for a class on personal essay precisely because I had no idea what a personal essay was. <laughs> and I thought, all right, I'm going to go. It's a four-day intensive class. I'm going to go learn something totally new. I may completely fall on my behind, but let's do it. And it changed everything. I mean, I the essay that I ended up writing as my final project became essentially the first chapter of this book. So at this point, I've now shared with a group of other writers that I am sort of on this beginning, this quest of if I'm going to have kids, I'm going to have to have them on my own. And this is what is propelling me forward. One of the other writers in the room was a woman named Lisa Manterfield, who unbeknownst to me had started going through fertility treatments, she and her husband in an effort to get pregnant. And she had started toying with the idea of I'm going to write a book about going through fertility treatments and that whole circus and ultimately have this happy ending miracle baby story. And so she was starting to sort of toy with that. We kept in touch. We just liked each other. We liked each other's writing. About a year later, she got back in touch and said, I want to start a writer's group. I think she initiated it. And we got together and we ended up getting a few other writers together and doing like a, I think we met quarterly sharing our things. And she's starting to submit chapters for this memoir. I'm taking my eggs and going home. That's what she ended up calling it. Great great. title. That's a great title. Uh, And somewhere along the line, someone said to her, you know, you got to start building the platform to start building your audience, which is, this was the thing back then. You need to have a blog. All right, fine. So I'll start this blog and I'll have this audience. And then when I sell my book, there'll be readers in place. It was the whole thinking, sort of. So she got started with it. She called it Life Without Baby. And it wasn't right at the start, but it was right as it was very early on. She said, hey, would you be interested in doing a column on sort of your journey? Okay. And honestly, my thinking at the time we started was we're writing for an audience of two. Mm. I'm writing to myself. I'm sorting this out. I had already started the journal that I was keeping because at this point, I'm not planning to write a book at all. I am literally trying to figure out how I'm going to become a mother by myself. And I'm journaling because I, that's how I process. And I want to keep notes so that I can look back as I start answering these questions for myself, these dilemmas. And as I'm starting to figure out what's not working, that also made its way into the blog. A lot of parallels there. And she's doing it well. And she's getting to the point where ultimately she realized she was not going to be able to conceive ever. Mm. And I'm realizing I don't want to be a mom on my own. And we're pretty open with this with this blog. And then the next step is that how in the heck do you make peace with this? My whole life was designed around, okay, I'll do this until I take on my real job of being a wife and mother. That's going to be my really, role. Even as it. successful as your as your writing career was, that's yeah, no, really what it you was, thought. It was, it was always, but how can I do this right? And like the fact that I was a freelancer and I could work from home. Well, that's something I could do while I'm raising my children. That was mm-hmm. That was the logic. And the crazy thing that still blows my mind is that all of a sudden we start hearing from these women around the world. We had readers in over 100 countries. Like we literally looked at a map and looked up how many countries are there in the world? How did you, you, because people would let you know where they're writing from? Is that how? We'd see that in the analytics, but also, yes, we would hear from people. And we started hearing from these women saying, me too. This is my story. Thank you so much for sharing this really ugly part of the journey. This is the first time I've heard anyone else say that they're experiencing what I'm experiencing, or they're off in this corner. I just had a miscarriage. Nobody knows I'm going through this. I'm so ashamed. And I got some hope reading what you guys are going through. You guys, I mean, we literally got letters from women saying you saved my life today, all because we were sharing the real raw, this is my story. And this is how I am coping as best I can or trying to come out of this. I mean, it was just extraordinary. So yeah, I wrote two different columns for that because we were posting at one point like three or four times a week. I mean, it was just gangbusters. Oh, that's a lot. And out of that came Holiday Companion, where we sort of looked back, I forget how many years we've been writing at that point. But we realized that there are so many triggers that happened during the year with holidays that are so hard. And, and, you know, actually we're in one right now, this whole back to school season. I have to tell you, even all my years 
of healing and moving forward, back to school season is really hard. Because to me, that was always sort of the start of the new year, even more than January 1st. And there's so much that's that's kid-oriented and new beginnings-oriented. And, yeah. and I loved school. I loved being with my friends. I loved the activities, the classes. I mean, there were so many things that I looked forward to doing with my own children. And every year, back to school is a reminder of what I don't get. Well, I would love to bring out what you just affirmed in Putting out your content, whether it's mm -hmm. written or recorded, one of the things that is a constant reminder, because I'm in a podcasting group on one of the social media platforms that happens live once a week, and we get people who are very seasoned to people who are looking to launch a podcast, mm -hmm. which is really why I wanted to give a shout out to the power of podcasting at the, the top of this, is there's so many people who are thinking, as you said, I'm going to just be doing this for an audience of one. Yeah. I mean, who's who's going to listen to my podcast? What do I have to say? And we always affirm that your message has an audience. Mm -hmm. You will find, or your audience will find yeah. you because your message is unique. The way you present it is unique. And you never know who desperately needs to hear it. 100%. So yeah. I love that you affirm that and that you... Because you touch upon this in your book, and let's talk about your beautifully written book, because you do talk about, and you use a phrase that was mentioned to you that gave you such comfort that you are not alone. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about your, it's, it's just a beautifully written, poignant, emotional, and incredibly humorous book, especially the content and everything that you're going through. For you to inject such humor says so much about you and your character. You. The mother of all dilemmas, dreams of motherhood, and the inter that changed everything. And if I may, I'd like to share the opening line. You really should have kids, you know. Mm -hmm. When I read that before I got to what your follow-up was on that, I think when someone or anyone shoulds on us, mm -hmm. I say that with air quotes, mm -hmm. it can be that they are really trying to get us to see a possibility or opportunity yeah. for us. Yeah. And, that, and that's the positive. However, it can also come from a place of power or authority or telling us what to do and shaming. It's also shaming. shaming. Yes, is a yes, big shaming. So, can you share who it was that said that and what it meant for you at that particular time in your oh, life? Oh boy, we, we we used the word pivot earlier in our conversation. So, this story is, and again, I, I am not going to name names in the book. I refer to him as Mister Not Quite Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> and uh, another really, you know, it's interesting. It was. Uh, it was a really great healing, good relationship that we, you know, anytime you're in a serious relationship and you sort of think, well, okay, well, what's the next step? What's the next step? And yet we both sensed that this was not going to be a forever. Mm. And there were, there were gifts. It was hard. Sometimes that was hard. It was hard to be, well, why not? You know, why am I not good enough? That's my head. And he gave me so many gifts and helped launch me to the marriage that I am in now. I would not be here if it had not been for the time I spent with him. And he is the one who said that to me. And he had observed me with a child, which he said, and I just had this wonderful report, this random child. And he was just mirroring back to me how great I was with kids and that I should be a mother. And he knew that he wasn't going to be the one to help me get there. And mm. it, it just the way that it happened in that moment was like this wake up call isn't even a strong enough term for it. But it just like a ton of bricks. Yeah, probably. I mean, it, it kind of thing like you almost want to just okay, I got to sit down. I, I got to take this in. This is he's he's right. He's absolutely right. Was my thinking the moment? If I should have kids, I would be a great mother. And clearly, the path I'm on at this moment is not going to get me there. So I have got to figure this out asap because I'm out of time. At that point, I was in my late 30s. My clock is ticking. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because I'd never thought of my clock as ticking. I wasn't. I, I just wanted, I wanted to get on with my life is the way I felt. It wasn't so much mm. the physical, biological clock ticking. It was, it was, I felt like I was on hold. I wasn't myself yet. I'm supposed to be a mother. I'm supposed to be doing, I'm supposed to be going through these milestones. All my friends are going through these milestones and I'm not. So I got to get on this. And so he gave me the gift of enough already. Figure this out. If you're going to do this, the only way you're going to do it, nobody else is going to do this for you. You are going to have to figure this out for yourself. And it just launched me. And not immediately. I didn't go the next day and start, you know, searching, Googling sperm banks, but I did that later. But I just started to look at things with a new perspective. And the big one was the shift that happened almost immediately was I don't want to be pursuing relationships 
with the sole purpose of, I need a father figure for my children, my future yeah. children. That is not a good enough relationship for me. I want to be in relationship with a partner, with someone who, whatever life hands us, we're in it together. And if that was the case, and my priority was going to be to have children, then I wasn't going to drag somebody into that. I didn't want to be interviewing people up front like, all right, how do you feel about this? Is it, this, it wasn't it. I wanted that relationship, but I knew the, that relationship I could take more time finding. But becoming a mother, I had to get on it because my eggs had an expiration date. <laughs> you know what I love in referring to him? You talk with him in, with such gratitude and grace. And I think sometimes when we go through a situation, especially when there is such a profound realization that this is not going to go where I thought it was, whether it's mm -hmm. business or personal mm -hmm. or what have you. We can get angry and resentful and mad and, and hurt. And, and yet you chose to see the gift, again, taking that cue of, okay, Kathleen, this is clarity. Because there is a gift in getting that kind of clarity. Yeah. Then it started you on this whole journey, as you say, to seek what that means for you. Mm -hmm. And so talk about what the internship was. What, what was it that helped you clarify your next step? Back up a little bit. So I'm writing this blog. I'm starting to explore my options. I'm journaling like mad. I'm, how do I figure this out? What do I have to do? And I started to joke with my friends. I need an internship. I need to, I need to practice, see what it's like to be a single mom and see if I can really do it. See if I really want to do it. Seriously, it was a joke. And then my sister called Carrie. I use her name. She called me this one day and she said, her wife, Kathy, she and Carrie were going to go to Europe. And at first they were going to take their 18 month old son, Jake, with them. And then they thought that was crazy smart. She said, would you, what would you think about coming up and babysitting him <laughs> while we're in Europe? And I, I, I mean, it's like the heavens opened up. I was going to say divine providence was, right there. It was, it was such a God move. It was just like, yes. I mean, it was everything that I had asked for. It was so, so crazy. Like, who does this, who does this happen to? No one, you know, that they would even ask me to do it. I, it just, it was just crazy. And so here I go and I'm like, okay, for two weeks, I'm, I'm going to take all my work with me. That was a really dumb move. But I wanted to have the full experience of being a single working mother to a toddler. I set out like, I'm going to prove to myself that I can do this. And I'm going to finish up this intro. And I'm going to be totally gung ho. And then I'm going to go out and make myself a baby and get on with my life. That was my plan. And I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to have this great end to my story, whether it's I, at that point, I don't even think I was thinking of it being a book yet, but I'm going to have this beautiful end to this story. If this is funny, you know, it's gonna be really funny. And it was so loving. I had this great internship and I learned everything I needed to know and got all the motivation I needed. And then I came home and have this miracle baby and my life is perfect. Hmm. <laughs> You're a writer. You're yeah. allowed to write stories like that. Yeah, but that didn't serve the story. So I get up there and without going into many details, I had two weeks of hard reality of exhausted out of my mind. I so understand my friends who have been new moms better of you can't even see straight because you know, you're know you on 24 seven responsibilities. And then the fact that he was someone else's kid and the last thing I wanted to do was have him, you know, return him damaged. Um, <laughs> yes, you know? and you, you wrote very humorously about that. And you know, it was, yes. it, it was I'm glad it's funny. And in the, in the moments, it's not, it's it's not, not funny. that no, funny. I, and I then on reflection, that. you go, okay, that's a little bit funny, you know, but it was scary. And, and then I'm trying to, you know, my work is very cerebral you know, and you realize quite quickly when you're that distracted and exhausted, exhausted. <laughs> that the, 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 the clever turn of phrase for a headline does not come easily. And I'm thinking, holy, how am I going to do this? Can I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not succeeding here. And, and what is it going to take for me to really do this? I think, well, the, the other side of it too, that really surprised me was having someone on me constantly. Mm. I realized how much I had not, had missed, had been deprived of physical contact. And that was a little scary to me. Like as a single woman living alone, how infrequently I was touched, okay? And how much we all need that. Yes. At any age. And it was, it was disturbing to me. Like, okay, um, you know, and, and so how, how do you fix that? Do you have more massages? Do you get your hair done more often so someone's <laughs> touching your scalp? I mean, those are the things you, you think about, like, or, you know, do you hug your friends more, try to see your friends more and have more physical contact? So all that stuff came up. And then having this little 
little human who was completely reliant on me. You know, I had a dog at that time, Bo, sweet Bo, and he was a wonderful companion, but it's not the same. It is not the same as having that little human to interact with. And all those things that I didn't even realize how much I missed and needed that and all that came out of that time. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to cut you off. I was just really affirming what you were saying. And sometimes we don't know Mm-mm. what we miss until we have it again and we yeah. go, oh my well, that's gosh, it. Yep. I've been deprived. Yep. And there were so many points, touch points in this book that brought me to tears. Mm. I'm I'm just guffawing all over the place. And my <laughs> husband's going, what's so funny? I go, well, you have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but if I may touch on chapter 19. Okay. Because. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just looked at my notes. Guys, which one was that? Passing the baby baton. Passing the baby baton. Mm. Because when I read that, that is the one that really kind of, if I wasn't lying down, it probably would have brought me to my knees Mm. because I'm a stepmom who's estranged from her stepdaughter. Mm. But I do recall a time that my husband and I were, we were very close. We did a lot of things with his daughter and we'd take trips together. And the thing that hurt the most is at the end of the trip, there was kind of the passing of her to her birth mom. And without a glance back, without a hug or anything, as soon as she saw her mom, our time was done. It just was done. And I understood it because young children, she was 13, 14, 15 at the time. They don't want to betray their their mom right. or their right. you know parents. But I remember going, wait a minute, we were just laughing and singing and playing and having fun in the car. And literally within a minute, that's completely gone. And I read that chapter and I just felt for you. I just went, and especially with the baby that you have you know, for two whole weeks mm-hmm. have given your heart and soul to mm-hmm. and that exhaustion. Mm-hmm. So I just got to ask you, because you've talked about how in some of your email correspondence that we've had recently, that you're getting amazing reviews and feedback from women who are not in your anticipated audience mm-hmm. and that you continue to be astonished by what readers get out of your story yeah. and that it helps them in their very different lives yeah. than what your life is like. So I'm curious if in some ways that gives you a sense that your story is serving a much bigger need and purpose than what you had imagined. Oh, 100%. Okay. I, I mean, yeah. I hear from moms that, you know, how deeply they connect with internship experience because they were so wiped out when their children were small that they've forgotten a lot of that. And that brought mm. back some really fun memories that, again, are in hindsight are hilarious and really touching and moving. And I think... One of the uh, the most extraordinary pieces of feedback I got was from a woman who is a therapist who got in touch and said she's been using the book to help her clients who are working through the loss of a big life dream and the grieving process. And it's not all about just being childless. It's about other big losses. And I, I was just blown away by that. And, and I heard from one woman whose children are in college and she's doing things and she was telling me she had read it and really enjoyed it. And then she got to the part towards the end of the book where I'm, I'm trying to make up my mind and I'm listing the pros and cons. And actually, I'm going to glance at my notes because the quote she gave me was really great. And she found herself as a successful mom having successfully lost her kids and she has a very full life. But she and her husband were facing a big decision and they were really, really struggling with it and sort of doing what I did, the bullet points of here are all the, what's the word I'm thinking of? The logical reasons. We should do it because of this, 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 and this. Or maybe we shouldn't do it that, that, and that. And But couldn't quite make a decision. And she got to the point where I was doing the same thing in the book and the, I, I just, I couldn't decide. I couldn't, there was, there was nothing. I kept waiting for that big moment of do this. And I realized that maybe the answer was that the fact that And here's what I wrote, because my head, my heart, my gut were not telling me to do it because I wasn't getting that big go sign that maybe that was my answer. And she said she read that and she said this brilliant sentence gave me pause. It's a formula that could be applied to many circumstances where one is forced to make an important life changing decision. And she shared it with her husband and they ended up making the decision they didn't think they were going to do, but it was the one that felt right because of the reasons that I just stated. I go, I wrote this thing and I didn't even see it that deep. <laughs> you know? I go, this is so fun. Yes. So I love, I love this stuff happens through that. And I love that this may be a little bit off the topic, but I think the story that I have heard the biggest response to out of the book is the story on Christmas Day, or actually it was Christmas Eve, when I'm with my extended oh. family. And <laughs> yes. I just clarify, this is my brother, who is an amazing human being. And he pulled me aside and he said, hey, could you come 
later on Christmas Day because we want to have family time. And what am I going to say? Oh, no problem, right? But oh my God, family, who am I? What am I? I'm not, I'm not this anymore. And it was so devastating. And it's so interesting to me. I have gotten so many emails and calls from women who have families say, I would never do that. I can't believe that happened. And I say to mm. them, so how many single people did you include in your last Christmas? Uh, none. And at your last dinner party, were, did you invite any of your friends who are divorced, widowed, if you had single people, did you invite two single people and see them together because they're the only single people in the room? Oh, you know, and they think about it. And I, oh, I guess one woman said, you know, I assumed they'd be with their own families. I said, well, how about if we stop assuming and just extend the invitation? I'm so glad you brought up that story because I hadn't planned on bringing that up, but I'm really glad you did. I was going to lead into the message of that story, though, and how it relates to, and, and you touch on throughout your book, so many ways that society knowingly or unknowingly yeah. dismisses or kind of does a, a social dissection of who we are as women. Yeah. As single women, mm -hmm. because you and I met in a faith community that I remember the very thing that you just touched on, sitting there doing holiday services, yeah. whether it was Easter or Christmas or what have you, and everyone's going off to have a party or a potluck or a family gathering and going home sometimes just sobbing my eyes out. Oh, because I was right there with you. Yep. And you touch on this in mm -hmm. your book. And I, and again, I'm not alone in that phrase that you've used, you're not alone, mm -hmm. is I didn't know that though, Kathleen, I know. because I was thinking, why is this faith community not addressing the fact that not everybody is in a family, whether mm -hmm. it's through being married or having an actual family of, of children mm -hmm. or extended family? There was one pastor who did that beautifully that always invited Yep. And that was Bill, who always invited people around for Thanksgiving dinner because he knew that there were people who didn't have yep. that. But we do that in so many ways in society. The shoulds, again, going back to the shoulds, not realizing this could be the very issue people are struggling with for so long and looking for their answers. And someone comes along and just goes, I think I'll pour some salt and vinegar right, right in that open wound. And all the family events, the family picnic, the family service. And yet, and I just read this great article in BBC, I'll send you the link about uh, single shaming, that that's even a mm. term just makes my toes curl. And they talk <laughs> yes. about that nearly half, half of the population in the U.S. is single. So where do we get off saying that the traditional and the normal, two words that should be retired, is husband, wife, children? Even husband, wife yeah. is, is not normal anymore. So why is that the ideal? And why is everybody else made to feel that they are less than and should be? I, it just, it's so crazy to me in this day and age that we even think like this anymore. And that's what I love about that this book has inspired people to not only open their eyes and open their hearts, but to have conversations about these things. It's really easy to be compassionate and to see other people and then get over it. I, that's my hope. That's my hope that we start being more inclusive because the flip side of that, the sharing of my Christmas story and the women who I then get to have a conversation with and get them thinking about it. When I share that story with single childless women, they all go, yep. <laughs> and they all have their version. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, enough, enough. And even the positions of mentioned earlier that as a, a step parent, there is, and, and it's very rare, at least in my world in my experience. When there's divorce, there just naturally tends to be a side that the child favors. Mm -hmm. Unless it's a really healthy separation, the parents have worked incredibly hard to make their child their needs first and foremost, as yeah. opposed to one of the parents' needs where, oh no, she's always with us. So that's just always the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And so even if someone is a step parent, to assume that that encompasses all the thing that a, quote, traditional family yeah. encapsulates. So thank you for bringing that up. On those points, because I think this is really interesting, too, is that that assumes that we aren't all flawed human beings just trying our best. Exactly. We are. We are. And I, I do talk to uh, one woman who I, I include interviews of the books, because that was one part of my research, is that, okay, I understand what's really happening here. And so I interviewed several women, all in different sort of phases of motherhood, from a woman who 
used donor sperm and became a mother on her own to a couple of women who became mothers late in life after they've been established in their careers. And one of the women, and her interview stuck with me, is a childless stepmom like you. And she came into a family with two teenagers. And one of the lines that struck me is that people would say to her, oh, typical conversation up here, do you have kids? And she would say yes, but there was like this asterisk hanging over her head, you know? <laughs> yeah. you know? And she said, the, her word was she felt like a fraud, you know? Mm. And she would go to, she, was, she and her husband were the primary caretakers, but of course the, the kids were completely, you know, attached to the mom. And, and so, but she was the one going to parent-teacher conferences even though she felt like she didn't really have the authority or she didn't have the license to be there, if you will. And we have all these challenging roles that I think if we all listen to each other and can work together a little bit better, best we can, we might make it all easier on ourselves. Why can't the family be blended? And these amazing kids have more people to love them. Exactly. Right? That, yeah, as opposed to mine, mine, mine. Yeah. This is my child. And just like being a parent doesn't come with a manual, right. trust me, being a step parent yeah. really doesn't. Right. You've got a whole other family that wouldn't exist in its natural way, if you will. But it, I look at it the same way. It's an extended family. Yeah. And, it, and if they're healthy relationships, that's more love to speak into a child's life. So yeah. I'll take it a step further and give you a little something outside of the story. So I am actually a uh, second wife. My husband's first wife passed away quite young. And in the process of our early stages of dating, he introduced me to her sisters, who he has stayed very close to. And they have become, and I, I was very clear up front, look, they're family. And her mom, who has since passed, there is no reason for them not to be part of our lives. And we were we were at some gathering and I overheard one of her sisters introduce herself as Braden's ex-sister-in-law. Pulled her aside later and I said, look, you, t you tell them you're our sister-in-law. No one's going to need an explanation. If they do, we'll draw them a map. You know, but, uh, <laughs> but, it, but, but why, why, why would I deny any of that relationship? Of course they're family. They've been amazing to me. I mean, I can't imagine how hard that would be to see their sister replaced, even though that was never what I was going to go for. But of course, they're still family. Kathleen, you are so incredibly gracious. <laughs> you really, you got to know how rare and gracious you are. And you brought this up. This was a question I have down here and I wasn't going to go there, but because you did bring up Braden mm -hmm. and you brought up extended family through him. You wrote in the article, Rebecca. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> one of the many poignant articles that you've written for the Bar Association of San Francisco's San Francisco Attorney Magazine. And you wrote about several experiences you had about being mistaken for your husband's departed yeah. former wife, which you just mentioned, who you apparently resembled in several physical characteristics. And some of the questions and examinations you went through, mm -hmm. through people who knew Braden's former wife, remind me of the scrutiny you endured when you were still single. Yeah. And the way you write about how you handled each situation, which I, again, is such grace and diplomacy, makes me wonder if what you had gone through as a single childless woman prepared you for this very different and yet other level of social scrutiny. Mm, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. I did not expect that at all. So I just to clarify, the essay I wrote about that is called Rebecca, and it was published on a wonderful, wonderful website called Full Grown People, which covers a bunch of topics of adulting, if you will. And there's a lot of fun. So I encourage you to check that out. So the short answer is the whole single childless shaming was was awful and still is surprising when it comes out of nowhere and just it's so unnecessary, but I think I handle it better. The whole repeatedly being mistaken for his first wife was shocking. And again, I, I didn't, I had no intention of replacing or negating what an incredible relationship they had. I think I said in the essay, the more I got to know about her, because I asked her sisters and I asked her friends to tell me about her and what she was like. And we would have been friends. I would have loved Yeah, this you mentioned woman. that in the article. And there's a true gift in that. The hard thing was, so as my husband has said, he has a type, which is pasty Irish, basically. So, <laughs> which I think is hysterical, but that's true. But, but, but beyond that, I mean, I'm like a foot taller than she was. 
So for people to get to miss that is just hysterical. I mean, did they think she grew an extra foot in her 40s? I don't know. <laughs> that was part of my initial question was that you mentioned you're taller, she's petite. And I'm thinking, where is the awareness for most people that know. you would not? And that says a lot about society kind of as a whole. Yeah. So but so my coloring, though, I mean, in all fairness, we do look a little bit alike. And we do had we had some things in common. Obviously, we had very good taste in men. But when I finally asked Braden, you know, am I, am I like her? And he said, no. And I said, well, how so? And he said, well, you're funny. <laughs> okay. I, that is a total compliment. And I think it's true. And okay. And, and I'm sure she had a good sense of humor too. I can't imagine, but I guess I'm really funny. But I think the challenging part is that it would happen in places where I was already a little uncomfortable meeting new people that I didn't know before, whatever. And then bearing this responsibility of having to break the news to them that not only am I not his first wife, but that she has passed. And they appeared to have had fond memories of this woman who they knew. There was one woman at a law school reunion. It was just because the woman ended up bursting into tears when I gave her the news. And I'm there like, I'm not really sure how to comfort her. You know, like it was just weird. And then other people. Which who were, puts you in an awkward position well, too. Yeah. And I felt so bad for her. But then I also was a little peeved. And then there were other people who were just critical in my face. And there, there was one story of a woman who came up to me and she was like critiquing me. As if I weren't there, it was like third person. And she says something like, oh, she really, like around the eyes, she really does look like her. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> Hello, I'm I, right I'm here. a human being in front of you. It was so cold and weird. And I, and in the moment, you don't have a witty comeback because you're just so stunned, you know? Yeah. When things like that happen, you, yeah. it really is quite shocking. And, but can I ask you, didn't Rebecca have a, a service, a memorial service where people oh, yeah. who were, okay. Yeah. Well, but it would be, and, and that was, you know, so these were like the one was someone who, um, the one woman who I tell who burst into tears, she was at a, uh, we had gone to Braden's law school class reunion. So the people hadn't seen them in a couple of decades. So uh, that kind of made sense. But and there's another woman that I think I mentioned there too, who kept saying, Oh, but I know I know you. I know we've managed to I'm like, No, you really don't. No, you just mm-mm. you just don't. And you know, these are people that maybe had only met her a couple of times in big group gatherings and, and there was some impression left, but enough that it transferred to me. And but it was so frequent. It happened so many times that it was just Okay, I the, the essay was was pretty much my coping with it. Like, okay, I got to I got to turn this into something that's going to make people laugh or think or feel because I have to get this out of my system and that will help me heal. Like, same thing, this book, you process your own emotions, your own grief, your own needs through writing and then sharing that story and then someone else sees it and it helps them. I'm surprised you didn't just walk in with a name tag that said, my name is Kathleen Guthrie Woods. Oh, oh, I do have I, name my name is sometimes. not Rebecca. Yeah. I am his second wife. Very yeah. nice to meet you. Mm-hmm. But even within that, you shared stories that were just humorous and so mm-hmm. gracious. Okay. When I'm over here on the sidelines reading your book, going, I would have popped her. <laughs> but you don't, I mean, and that comes back to this whole, this whole single shaming and childless shaming thing is that mm-hmm. y- y- the wound is already open. Right. And you think you're healing it. And then this stuff comes out of left field. Like I I remember this one story from a reader early on from Life Without Baby. And she was telling about she and her husband were at this big family reunion. It was like a Thanksgiving dinner. And they're all around the table and they had just had another miscarriage and they hadn't even, and they hadn't even told anybody they were pregnant because they'd been through this before. And someone across the table says to her, so which one of you is the reason you can't have kids? (gasps) Uh Uh-huh. Oh, Kathleen. And you, and there is no come back to that and you're and you're in that moment and you're already hurting so deeply and that you can't come up with something witty and there's things that have gone around like what are the appropriate responses and what might you sing back to people and you know we get you have kids and my husband usually pops up with we have dogs and just doesn't say anything we just leave it at that you know and move on but it takes time to find a response that feels comfortable for you to say and then to actually have the courage to say it and the timing to say it and the wherewithal to say it in the moment. Well, yeah, because you're so sucker punched. It reminds me of, I don't know if you were ever into the film Bridget Jones. Oh, of course, yeah. There's a great scene where she goes to that dinner party Mm -hmm. at Christmas and she's single and someone does a similar thing. With all the smug married couples. Oh, with all the smug married couples. And she gets asked the question, when are you going to get knocked up, Bridge? You really should get on it. uh, (laughs) Chop, chop. 
let's talk about 52 nudges because we're okay. we're coming to the end of our time and I, I really feel like we could just go on and I, I actually have a whole other I have a whole other page of questions for you. So let's talk about your blog, 52 nudges. How did that come about for you? Oh, you know, it's so it's so interesting. It's a little similar to the story we talked about earlier when I was sick and had to pivot. Let me lay a little foundation for this. I have personally and also in my career had the privilege of interviewing so many women of different ages and different backgrounds. And one of the big life lessons I have learned, especially talking to older women who are mentors or have been mentors even informally, is how many times in a woman's life we have to reinvent ourselves. We are called upon to reinvent ourselves, whether it's shifting from career woman to new mother, whether it's the empty nest, whether it's changing careers or changing relationship status or health things. And the option is you can either curl up in a ball and feel sorry for yourself or struggle and not want anything to change, or you pivot. And I really think this is an important life skill and we have got to learn how to do it or we're going to be miserable. So very similar to what happened 20 plus years ago when I got sick and had to figure out a whole new career and life plan. This was definitely pre-pandemic. Whenever the new gig law came out that was designed to protect people that were just being abused as contract employees, no benefits, et cetera. And the fallout of that is that it was going to negatively impact people like me who depend on contract work. Mm Mm-hmm. And especially writers and journalists, oh my gosh, you know, and they were, what they were doing is they were going to put a cap on how many jobs you could do for one client before they had to hire you, which just wasn't going to happen. And reading about this and everybody's in this panic and I called my, my tax guy, my financial consultant, and I said, what do I need to know? Is, is my business done? Do I need to get back out in the job market and get a full-time job? And they calmed me down and said, let's just wait and see and whatever. But I really thought, all right, I've got to prepare for the next pivot. Is this the end of this career? Is this the end of this chapter of my life? And what am I going to do? And the amazing thing that came out of it is I thought, I'm not scared. I'm actually, I actually feel really excited. I have a blank slate and anything is possible. How fun is that? And I was kind of like, who are you? How, where did this come from? And it, it made me realize that I really thrive in a taking a leap without a net situation. And I like, you know, I remember that girl where, where, but where has she been? I've gotten a little too comfortable these last 18 years. And I really like that gal. And I want to do more of this. How do I, one, create opportunities for me to take more risks and not crazy stuff, not jumping out of airplanes. That's, I don't need to go there. <laughs> but then this other thing of like, but what do I want to do next, especially at this point in my life? And how do I figure that out? And I thought you read these things like, you know, what are the 10 favorite things you love to do? Okay, great. What am I most curious about? And I thought, okay, I've got to find a workshop or something that helps me figure this out. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find that take a risk every day book or anything. And I thought, okay, well then I'm going to make this up. I'm going to create it. And I came up with this idea that every week for 52 weeks, I would nudge myself to try something new, whether it was study something that I've always been interested in or revisit a pastime that I really loved doing when I was younger and I haven't done for ages. It was, it was creative stuff. It was physical stuff. It was spiritual stuff, spiritual growth stuff. Oh, I really want to get good at meditation. Well, I've been saying that for years. And I put together this list and same thing like the other blog we talked about, I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do a blog for no other reason than I'm going to write it for myself and keep myself accountable. So I finish this every week for 52 weeks. Next thing you know, I've got readers from all over the place. Of course you do. I, I mean, it just, it's been so fun. I'm on officially round three because we've taken some breaks and we've gone over 52 weeks and done some special things. But I continue every week to nudge myself out of my little nest of comfort. And there have been some that have been epic failures, which is part of the learning process. Okay, really? I don't like I, gardening. I kept trying to get myself excited about gardening. I hate gardening. I finally Do you really? Because I read that in, in one of your articles that you wrote that you set up all your, your and your husband's gardening tools in your basement. I'm like, she likes gardening. No, so do I. I really don't. You hate it. <laughs> I don't. I really don't. I did not. My I come from a family of, like, my mom is, her garden has like won awards and been featured in magazines for good grief. And my siblings are both really great gardeners. And I did not get that gene. I love cooking and baking. I love it. So, okay, then I need to stop trying to force myself to be a gardener and embrace what I really enjoy. Absolutely. You know? Hey, well, that's that that goes across the board in, in life, yeah. I think. In, but we in, don't in do anything. it. We get busy with our lives and our to-do lists. And so I carve out a little time each week when I 
stretch myself a little bit and learn new things about myself. And hopefully, ultimately, it's like, will it guide me to a new opportunity of work, maybe, or the fact that I'm just having a little more fun in life than I normally would. And to take 52 weeks and say, I'm going to try something. How many people actually have the consciousness to do that? And I love, first of all, it's a great name. Thank you. And love your current series, which is all about sharing your humor, combating so much of the negativity in the yeah. news and, yeah. and in social media. And I want to thank you for sharing the YouTube video of sportscaster Andrew oh, Cotter my gosh. narrating yeah. the antics of his dogs, Olive and Mabel, which are so darn funny and creative. And I had never heard of them. So oh, thank you I'm for so sharing glad I that. introduced you. Oh, my. I watched one and all of a sudden now I'm on six. Yeah. And I'm like, that's how it starts. Be. Yeah. And it's videos like this that truly do offset the rest of the junk out there. So thank and you for is, starting this and, and his for is sharing a perfect it. example of a nudge. This is a gentleman. He's Scottish and he's a sportscaster. And the pandemic hit and suddenly, you know, first they're saying, oh, we're going to take a couple weeks off. We know this, right? And then suddenly it's like, all right, we're going dark for six months. And he's kind of bored. And so he starts narrating his dogs eating breakfast. <laughs> That's how it started. And he now has, what was it? That first video got something like 10 million hits. Insane. So he now amount. is on a speaking yeah. tour with his dogs. I think there's a book Seriously? about it. Like oh this gosh. whole thing came out of him going, all right. I've got to pivot. I'm going to use my skill to do something totally different and entertain myself. He's probably thinking I'm going to send this video to my my wife and my friends and a couple family members. And it's this whole thing. It's so you never cool. know. You never know. Again, it's your message yeah. that you think is for an audience of one, and all of a sudden you are a worldwide phenomenon, yeah. or you have 110 countries writing you about your blog, Kathleen. And so in addition to your nudges, in addition to combating all the negativity out there, what makes you hopeful? Oh, gosh. I, I can think of a couple answers. I'm going to say one is that right now is, you know, world events, pandemic, everybody's got their own worries, whatever. But I have been really impressed with my extended group of girlfriends and how even with all our burdens, we keep checking in on each other mm -hmm. and sharing. We're sharing each other's burdens, even if it's just by calling and checking in with each other. And I just, I'm so grateful for that. I will say, and this sentence funny coming from a childless person, but I am so encouraged by the generations coming up. I have nieces and nephews and godsons who are incredible human beings. And there are days when I am leveled by the thought of the world we're leaving them. And then there are other days and I think they are our great hope. I, I look at what some of these young people, God, I sound like an old fart when I say that, but it's true. I look at what some <laughs> we, of these young, we are old I farts, am, okay? and I'm just owning it. <laughs> but what these young people are doing and they're making a difference in small ways that then have ripple effects to to change the world in big ways. And I find that so encouraging. They have every reason to throw in the towel, you know? And they don't. They're they're coming up with creative solutions and inspiring the rest of us and motivating us to get off our butts and and participate. And I wow, wow, humans are so resilient. It's phenomenal. It is, and thank God for it, because if it all ended with us. And I'm sure every generation before us who dealt with their own, if it's World War I, World War II, the Great Plague of 1918, if everybody thought, mm -hmm. okay, it ends with us, yep. there would be no hope. So yep. that's a great answer. Yep. And, and yep. I appreciate you saying that. Yep. And so in turn, is that what, also what brings you joy? Yes. And I have, I have so much to be grateful for. I'm grateful for every day, even the tough days, because they helped form who I am now. And what brings me joy is my husband and I have two dogs that are so, they're not Olive and Mabel, but they're awfully close in my book. And they are just pure loves. And my husband just delights me. <laughs> He's so fun. And I feel so very, very lucky. We did not get to talk about the late bloomer stuff that you and I both married, quote unquote, late in life. But boy, was he worth the wait. And you could tell that I was say when I read the chapter in your book about your relationship. I First of all, I live in wine country and your romantic getaway to wine country. I'm like, I want to go to that. Yeah. <laughs> it was so lovely. And just the way you marbled him throughout your story and his tenderness and his patience and his kindness to an empathy for what you were going through and just your love for each other really came through that. So mm -hmm. I definitely feel that. And my final question if there was a soundtrack to your life, what would be on it and why? Wow. 
this may be the worst answer. I'll probably come with a better answer. But what comes to mind is the soundtrack from The Big Chill. And the reason I think of it is I feel like if we put that music on, we would be dancing through life and mm. not, not ballroom dancing. It doesn't need to be partners. It's <laughs> yes. everybody in the room is up on their feet, bopping around, skilled, not skilled, some people with rhythm, some people without, but we're all up in the room dancing together. And I would hope that that would be my soundtrack. Love it. I absolutely love it. And before we say goodbye, I want to let our listeners know that your book, The Mother of All Dilemmas, paperback and ebook, is available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and can be ordered through their local bookstore and also through public libraries. The ebook is available through Hoopla and the paperback can be requested. Or you so generously offered a copy to give away. And if I might add to that, an autograph copy to give away. I would be happy to. Yeah. So all you have to do if we have some dogs out there who want to go and go to the computer and record uh, Olive and Mabel, if you're listening, or what are your dogs' names? Uh, Louie and Bear. Louie and Bear. Bear. I love. What, what is? What kind of dog is Bear? Bear is. Uh, he just turned ten months old. He is a Labrador Retriever <gasps> and ginormous and still growing. Ten months old. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So Louie and Bear, go to your computers. <laughs> All you have to do is visit CherylHalling.com. Leave me a brief recorded message on my podcast page, sharing your thoughts about this episode. And I'll enter you into a random drawing for one lucky winner to receive a copy of The Mother of All Dilemmas, Dreams of Motherhood, and the Internship that Changed Everything. Fabulous. Fabulous. Kathleen Guthrie Woods, I can't thank you enough for reaching out to me to reconnect, sharing your book, your heart, and your hard-fought wisdom with us. And please know you are welcome back anytime. <laughs> I hope it's not another 20-plus years before it we be. speak again. God willing, we're around in 20 years. Knock on wood. Yes. <laughs> Knock on With wood. Most of our uh, most of our original parts. Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, thank you. It has been it's it's such a pleasure to talk about these things and think about things and consider what we might do differently and how we all might treat each other a little better. So thank you for this opportunity. You are very welcome, Kathleen. Thank you so much. Maybe you wanna give me kisses sweet. I'd also like to thank the following news outlets for the use of their clips and so aptly painting the picture of the fear that we're facing during this pandemic. BBC, PBS, Now This, UNESCO, and Some Good News. I especially want to thank Joel and Luke Smallbone, otherwise known as the group for King and Country, for allowing me to use an excerpt of their song Together, which could not be a more hopeful and inspiring song for such a time as this. Finally, I'll leave you with the following from Proverbs 23:18. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Thank you again for joining me today. Feel free to offer feedback or a story idea at 19stories at soundsatchelstudios.com via Instagram at Cheryl Holling VO. I look forward to sharing more stories on the next episode of 19 Stories from Fear to Hope. Until then, stay healthy and hopeful. Together with our differences, together we are bolder, braver, stronger.